Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Um, on behalf of Proud FT and FT Embrace, thank you so much for joining us today for our first um, virtual panel of the week. Um, so again, happy Happy Pride Month, everyone. Um, we are really happy to be able to come together as um, employee networks for the FT and put on um, the series of events to help remind us of the progress we've made, um, you know, as an LGBTQ community, um, but also in this uh, special time to reflect on a lot of the progress that we still have to go. So, um, you know, a lot of changes have happened in 2020. We've kind of had to adjust to a new way of working, a new way of living, interacting, socializing. Um, you know, case in point, this panel, normally we would conduct this, you know, live in the offices, but instead we're going to be doing this um, completely virtual. So we still think it's going to be an amazing event um, and we have some wonderful speakers lined up for you. Uh, and I just really want to take this time as well, though, to just let you know the reason we decided to choose this topic, um, you know, systemic inequality in healthcare, um, is because you know, continually this year, we've seen with the challenges of coronavirus, um, you know, countless people have been affected, lives have been changed. Um, and in the most recent few weeks, too, we've also had the killing of George Floyd. And these events kind of, you know, represent a challenge to all of us, like as a society, it's happening, not just in the US, but on a global scale. But still in that way, there are certain members of our communities that are more disproportionately impacted. Um, but I am encouraged to see, you know, the, through the protests and the demonstrations and through all of us, you know, going into these lockdowns to make sure that we're, you know, keeping each other safe and healthy, that the way out of these, these challenges and struggles are going to be staying together and to be unified. Um, and you know, in that spirit, uh, we've really decided to think hard about our partnerships this year. Um, so for the month, we've decided to um, collaborate with um, Lambda Legal. Um, and we have one of their, their speakers here today, um, a representative, his name is uh, Josh Bushkin. And I'll introduce him shortly to give a little bit more background to the group. Um, but our other fundraising partner will be um, the UK Black Pride. Um, and you'll hear from a representative from that group um, at this Thursday's panel. So we hope you'll tune into that as well. Um, but again, just thank you guys so much for joining. Um, and I'm going to pass it on to, um, to Josh. Thank you so much, Andre. Can you hear me okay? Great. Nice to see you all today. And thanks for having us. I'm Josh Pushkin. I'm the Chief Development Officer at Lambda Legal. Lambda is the nation's oldest and largest impact litigation organization dedicated to advancing the full equality for LGBTQ people and everyone living with HIV. And since its founding, we've made incredible strides towards the full legal equality for our community. In the last, um, oh, sorry, in the last 20 years, we successfully struck down sodomy laws still on the books, won nationwide recognition of marriage equality in 2015, and in our most recent win last week, secured LGBTQ non-discrimination protections in employment uh, in the ruling of the Supreme Court. But every turn when we make progress, our opponents try and reverse our achievements towards justice. One particularly egregious example is in healthcare, the subject of today's panel. The COVID-19 pandemic has disproportionately impacted low-income communities and marginalized communities with an outsized effect felt within the LGBTQ community and among those living with HIV. Sadly, just two days before the landmark SCOTUS ruling decision last week, protecting LGBTQ people in the workplace, the Trump administration and the Health and Human Services uh, Administration finalized a rule and attempt to roll back anti-discrimination protections in healthcare, essentially allowing healthcare workers, doctors, hospitals, and health insurance companies that receive federal funding to refuse to provide or cover healthcare services critical to the health and well-being of LGB LGBTQ people and everyone living with HIV. Most alarming, this was announced during a global pandemic. But just yesterday, we filed a lawsuit against HHS and we will see them in court. This also isn't the first time that our community has weathered a pandemic. Lambda Legal's response to the HIV crisis of the 1980s as a reference point, we won the first HIV discrimination lawsuit in the nation. We stayed strong and continued working, mitigating the devastating impact of HIV inequality and discrimination by helping those significantly impacted by the disease. Our, then, our work then informs our commitment to compel change now. We'll continue to push back against all attempts to diminish the legal security and safety 
of the, our community within the United States. We will fight in the courts, in legislatures, and in the court of public opinion, but our opponents know that they are losing the battle of hearts and minds, just as they lost in the past. But anti-LGBTQ forces are doubling down and now have allies occupying both the White House and the Senate. They're pushing hateful laws and regulations at the federal and state level and continue to stack our federal judiciary with extremist judges who care more about preserving their narrow worldview than applying the law in a fair and impartial manner. That's why we need your support now more than ever, and we encourage everyone to donate to Lambda Legal, where you can contribute at lambdalegal.org slash donate. I'm pleased to share this, and you'll see on our donate page that this month, our friend Anita Mae Rosenstein has pledged to match every dollar raised for Lambda Legal this month up to $100,000 in honor of Pride Month. And you can help Lambda Legal continue to combat discrimination against our communities across the country. And we're insistent that we'll continue the struggle that began 47 years ago. We've, began here, but we've been here before, and we're certain that we can move forward so that our mission not only continues, but our work is successful to protect our communities. Thank you so much for this opportunity to speak with you today, and I hope you have a fantastic panel and a wonderful Pride Month, and that you all stay safe. All right, well, thank you so much, Josh, um, for that introduction to Lambda Legal and for giving us a little bit more background. Um, so again, reminder, everyone, we're running um, the fundraiser on the GoFundMe um, for the rest of the month and probably a few weeks um, after. Um, so feel free to donate. Anything you have um, will help um, you know, toward that mission. Um, and so now I'm gonna hand it off pretty soon to uh, Alua Kemi to kick off our panel. Um, we have some amazing speakers from across you know, academia, policy, and activism to really speak more on this topic of systemic inequality in healthcare. Um, and as a reminder, please submit any questions you guys have um, during the panel on the Slido. Um, the link should be in the calendar invite um, with the code hashtag FT Pride Week. Um, so without further ado, I'm going to hand it off to Alu Kemi in our panel. Thank you, Andre, um, and thank you everyone so much for being here. Um, like, uh, just to kind of set the stage, the title of this panel is Systemic Inequality and How Diseases Discriminate. Um, and I think right now, especially living through this pandemic, we have the sense that it's changing everything, the way that we live, the way that we walk down the street, who we are able to uh, communicate with. Um, but I also, there's a sense that we, we've always lived in a society with systems. And I think more now more than ever, what this pandemic has done has highlighted some of those pre-existing conditions within society. So like the inequality in access to care, um, bias based on socioeconomic status, racial inequalities and health outcomes. Um, and that has really, um, been focused in how we've seen COVID-19 disproportionately affect black and brown communities. Um, and just so you have some of these numbers in your mind, um, recent research shows that the mortality rate from COVID-19 for black Americans is 2.3 times higher than the rate for white Americans um, and Asian Americans and 2.2 times higher than the rate for Latino Americans um, for Black Americans who are enrolled in Medicare, which is the National Health Insurance Program, which um, mostly uh, serves low, um, older adults. Um, we find that uh, Black Americans are hospitalized with COVID-19 um, at rates nearly four times higher than their white counterparts. So um, that's just kind of the big picture overview of what we are thinking about presently when we think about the idea that diseases discriminate. Um, and our panelists have a very unique and broad perspective on another healthcare crisis that's really salient with the LGBTQ plus community, and that's the AIDS crisis and the HIV epidemic that continues to illustrate the inequality at work in our healthcare system. So um, another statistic is that African Americans are 13% of the U.S. population, but account for nearly 42% of all of the new HIV diagnoses in 2018. So um, with all of this knowledge that, you know, racism exists and it's bad, um, and there are these really big systems at work, I, I hope that 
we can come together um, and especially over the next 45 minutes or so really think of, you know, there was a before the pandemic and right now we're, we're living in it, but how do we want this um, after to look like? How do we get there? And so without further ado, um, I will just uh, introduce our panelists and we'll get started with our um, discussion. Um, we are joined um, we're joined by Michelle Lopez, who is a public health consultant and advocate, and she's been working in this field for nearly three decades and brings a lot of her own personal experience to her advocacy. Um, uh, Dustin Duncan is a professor of epidemiology at Columbia University in New York, and he studies how neighborhood characteristics influence population health and health disparities. And also uh, we're joined by Jen Cates, who is the director of the Global Health um, and HIV Policy at the Kaiser Family Foundation. And her research there also focuses on uh, the role that the federal government plays in how we combat the HIV academic. Um, and so I guess to open up the discussion, um, I really wanted to begin with where we are right now and today. Um, and uh, Michelle, perhaps you could answer this question. Um, in what ways have you seen how this public health response to coronavirus mirror what you've experienced um, with uh, or studied with HIV? Well, thank you again uh, for having me and your question. Um, truly, I'm going to give you two point perspectives from this. One, from my lived experience, and two, from what I'm actually seeing both family members and colleagues of mine are experiencing right now. Uh, I am someone that I'm in my 30th year of being diagnosed with HIV, and I have used the Medicaid system um, to take care of my health needs, also to navigate some of the specialty care. And one of the things that continues to frustrate me, and I continue to be an advocate, I'm, I've now become my own advocate because of resources, colleagues that I have befriended um, throughout the years, I literally uh, physically have to go through and, and show my presence in systems and letting them know I'm being violated because of the comparison and the impact of me having these challenges. So a prime example that I can give to you, um, I live in New York City right now. Um, because of uh, my diagnosis, which is not just HIV, I'm diagnosed with um, two other, one um, uh, mental health diagnosis and also two, I'm a diabetic. And I can say the challenge that comes before me, the frustration that it then leads to is because of me having to have access to specialty care because that's the need. I am now 54. And when I got diagnosed at the age of um, 24, um, HIV was the primary diagnosis. As the years continued, you know, because of me not having access to good medical care, within two years of my diagnosis, I had an AIDS diagnosis. I developed uh, PCP pneumonia. I then was exposed to, um, because of a living situation I was in, exposed to um, cat feces. And that then led me, uh, I developed a complication called toxoplasmosis. And it was not until a colleague of mine who is Caucasian came to the hospital and literally said to the doctor, she's not getting the appropriate care. And to hear a doctor say to her, well, she has Medicaid, what do you expect? It was the first prompt in my life to let me know I am now not getting the best of care. I am now in jeopardy of my livelihood just because of me having this Medicaid. The second piece um, that also too, that was a major challenge as a woman of color also too, I am someone that originally I'm from the Caribbean, I'm an immigrant. So I identify, I identify as black Latina. And through my experience, when I got discharged from the hospital, my follow-up care was in jeopardy because again, I literally had workers saying to me, Miss, you have Medicaid. 
And because you have Medicaid, you know, you cannot see this particular doctor, which was a specialist who would have been critical in my follow-up care. I then had to negotiate through the support of colleagues of mine who were not of color, who did not have health, um, um, Medicaid health insurance. They had other uh, private insurance. Similarly, they would come into the hospital with me and compare their diagnosis, and they would literally say to the, um, you know, attending there, this is unfair what you're doing to her because she has Medicaid, because she's a black person, because she's an immigrant. So these were the experiences that I experienced very early, and it led me then, I had to find community, and I'm speaking about community within the gay white male population who had access to resources, who had access to advocacy that was creating change. And the wonderful thing I believe that happened is that I was embraced. I was not discriminated by my peers because we had that common ground. We all were fighting for the best of care, access to treatment as someone, you know, diagnosed and living with HIV. Eventually then it led me to actually advocating now and finding where I then became a voting member of decision-making bodies. And again, this was accommodated, facilitated because of my gay white male friends that says, listen, she's a woman of color. She has this disease. I also too has a daughter that was born perinatally infected. Um, her care, I remember my daughter, many, there were at least 10 different occasions as a kid where the doctors looked at me and says, you know, she's, she was born with this disease and we don't expect that she's gonna live over the age of maybe nine or 10. So already I was getting from the healthcare system because here this is now a black child diagnosed with AIDS. So my advocacy work was a twofold. I needed to understand first, I had to save my life and put you know, my advocacy in place so that I could be able to fight for both my daughter's survival and mine. Fast forward, here we are now in 2020, my brother is someone who recently has been diagnosed with COVID, okay? He has private insurance, but as a black man, because of the na you know, his neighborhood where he works, when he got hospitalized, he was sent home on two occasions. His wife, who is Caucasian, she's also too, she works and they have the same health insurance, literally now had to take on, you know, take on the advocacy, presenting herself, showing them this is my husband and what you guys are doing to him. It is, you know, it is just not acceptable. So right now, it, you know, I, I, I pretty much, you know, thank God to my sister-in-law. Um, she got them to readmit him. They have now provided the right screenings for my brother. He now has pneumonia in both of his lungs with the same insurance that him and his wife has. And it's because of her stepping forward and advocating on his behalf. As of today, he's finally going to be getting the right care that he should. So I have my lived experience. Um, you know, I have, you know, what I am seeing family members, you know, like myself, even though he has a much better private insurance, but yet still my brother's life and his care can be in jeopardy if his wife did not step into, you know, being that advocate and ensuring that he's getting the best of care. So my work continues. My advocacy is not just focusing because I am someone living, you know, with this virus. No, my advocacy is related to my race. It is related also to my diagnosis that I have, that I must receive the best of care that I can in order for my survival. And also too, it's not just about me. It's a community of us out there. So I'll, I'll, I hope I gave some diligence, you know, just sharing those experiences, but there's quite a lot more because now I have built some, um, what I would say, I have built a team together, you know, that I can pick up the phone, send an email on what do you think I should do or who should I call? That's the way I'm at right now.
Thank you so much, Michelle. I mean, I just um, can't even imagine uh, when you are when you are unwell and you're looking for a system to support you and to have your best needs at the center of your care, but you still have to figure out, you know, the vocabulary, navigating systems, calling on community. Um, I, I, you know, I, I can't even imagine um, what it's been like to to develop all of those skills. Um, and I was just wondering, maybe Jen, if you could, you, you know, you're working at the policy level. So when you hear something, you, like when you hear the state of what people must do to self-advocate, to, you know, build that community, um, what are some of your initial thoughts just hearing Michelle's story? Yeah, thank you so much for the opportunity to be here and um, and be part of this. And and Michelle, hi, we we've we've met and been at meetings together, and but it's always so powerful to hear what you say. Um, yes, when you, I think what it shows is that well, first of all, we know we all um, live in in the U.S. I assume most people, or maybe not everybody, on this webinar, but you know that you always have to advocate for yourself in the healthcare system, right? That's a challenge that everybody faces. But I think what Michelle was getting at is that if you are have brown skin, black skin, if you are gay, if you are different in some way, that advocacy is so much harder. That that the, cha the challenge of trying to get what you what everyone should should get is either um, challenged by stigma, it's challenged by misinformation, it's challenged by legal and regulatory barriers that people face. So when I hear that, I you know, I in my head, I'm thinking about all of the sort of policy levers where they exist that you can try to uh, move to make to lessen those barriers. I mean, even when you re reduce policy and legal barriers, there's still other barriers out there. How how people actually get treated just in their interactions um, and the information that they do or don't have to help guide guide their act their 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 own behavior and and access to to services. Um, but it's, I'm, I'm just really saddened to hear the experience, for example, of um, Michelle's brother right now, who's really suffering and not able to get what he needs or is finally, hopefully, going to. And that experience just sounds so um, unfortunately familiar to what's happening, particularly to so many Black Americans in, in right now with, with COVID. Um, there is nothing inherently about COVID um, or HIV that that puts one person more at risk than another about just because of who they are. It's really around the circumstances in which people find their lives and the ability that they have to navigate difficult situations. So, um, you know, there there's we can get into some of the policy things. I know that in the beginning we we heard about the recent Supreme Court decision, which is a huge uh, step forward in in removing some of the some major barriers, but also the challenges still left in the healthcare system. Um, one other thing I'll just say that hopefully we can talk about at some point is one of the major um, steps forward in re re reducing barriers to access was the Affordable Care Act that was passed in 2010. And despite the challenges to the Affordable Care Act, despite that it is not a perfect solution to all the problems, it actually did help to expand access to millions of, of people in the United States um, in so many ways. And so that is something to look at and try to understand. Thanks. Thank you, Jen. Um, Dustin, um, I think right now your work um, is, as an epidemiologist, is at the center of so many different conversations. The ones that we're having about the ongoing HIV epidemic and it's disproportional and how the transmission of it is still affecting um, black and brown Americans a lot higher than white counterparts. And then now as we're get, getting more data about COVID-19 and who it's affecting um, that as well. And I, I am very curious because you study neighborhoods and physical spaces and the role that they have um, in how we see these diseases unfold. And so um, I'm, just, I'm just curious how you're thinking of the two together, um, like, HIV epidemic and now also COVID-19? Sure, that's a great question. And first I wanna just appreciate Michelle and Jennifer for your comments, because I think that they're really important. And I think that to combat social justice or to fight for social justice and, and change, I think we, we need these uh, different perspectives. We need policy, we need advocacy, and, and we need research. Um, to answer your question, I think COVID-19 really represents 
uh, and mirrors uh, health inequalities that we see across many conditions. HIV is one, but I, I think it's, and, and, I, and, and, I, and I recognize the importance of, of talking about HIV, but, uh, but LGBT people experience, you know, a wide range of other health conditions, mental health conditions, substance use, uh, 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 disparities, uh, sleep, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And I haven't found, and I'm not aware of, uh, a health condition where we don't see stark disparities across many lines, one of which are, you know, um, thinking about LGBT people. And then just to highlight uh, briefly that, you know, it's, we, we sh it's, it's important that we understand and think about disparities overall, you know, by sexual orientation and gender uh, identity, but, you know, there are intersections there that are important. So I myself identify as a gay black man and my experience as a, 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 as a black man uh, may be different than uh, the experience of a white man who also is gay. So there is some commonality there, but we there are also disparities. And so I just wanna highlight that. Um, so for example, we know that one in six uh, men are men in their lifetime will acquire HIV. But when we think about uh, disparities in HIV, it's starkly different by race ethnicity. We know that number is one in 11 for white men and one in two for black men. So put differently, 50% of black gay men, like myself, I'm a black gay man, will acquire HIV in their lifetimes. And then we think about, I was thinking about Michelle's comments, and I'll answer your question a little bit uh, deeper in a second, but thinking about Michelle's comments about healthcare and health access and availability and knowledge and health insurance. A former partner of mine, who's a white gay man, talked about his friends and said, well, you know, everybody I know is on PrEP. And I said, well, I'm on PrEP, but many people are not on PrEP because they don't have the access to get on PrEP. You know, if you live in a neighborhood that is uh, marked with crime and violence and you don't have a job, I'm not sure that PrEP and HIV prevention is on the forefront of your brain. Perhaps what's on the forefront of your brain is making sure there's food on the table, making sure that you have the support systems to actually go through life. Um, so I just wanted to highlight, yes, we know that these disparities exist. Um, two, to think about the intersection of these disparities. And then to highlight, you know, HIV and COVID are, are important, um, but there are a wide range of other health conditions that I study and that uh, uh, research shows that, you know, that there are disparities in. Um, but secondly, I think, you know, that the parallels between COVID and HIV slash other health conditions where we see disparities, including by sexual orientation, um, I think what it really mirrors, um, and based on my training and perspective, um, is it really mirrors the social inequalities we see in society. It's, it's not surprising that <clears throat> the, the who is at highest risk for COVID infection and COVID mortality is this very similar or mirrors the exact same population who uh, is at risk for HIV infection and HIV mortality. And it's my belief and research shows that, you know, that these social inequalities in our society and across societies, quite frankly, are what is giving rise to this disproportionate or this, this the distribution and really the inequalities that we see in, in health. And what I mean by social inequalities is, you know, the access to jobs that people have, uh, one's experience day to day. I mean, we could talk about police violence and the discrimination that people experience and how that um, uh, impacts people's willingness to uh, 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 engage in prep, et cetera. Um, I was literally reading an article this morning from a colleague of mine from Rutgers University, Devin English, um, who looked at uh, police discrimination and HIV outcomes among uh, uh, black sexual minority men. Perhaps not surprisingly, finding, I, I won't pull the paper now, but something like 46% of black sexual minority men in the national sample of, 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 of black uh, 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 sexual minority men report police discrimination in the past year. And perhaps not surprisingly, police discrimination was associated with, excuse me, uh, uh, sexual risk behaviors and less likely these men who reported sexual, uh, uh, excuse me, police discrimination were less likely to uh, be willing to use PrEP. Right. So I think that the, the confluence of a wide range of social conditions where we live, where we work, where we play and the experiences in these places really, you know, shape our health and well-being. Um, and I think from uh, to, to build on and um, and further conversation, you know, with Michelle and Jennifer, I think that, you know, it's it's certainly time for there to be change to uh, to, act, to uh, um, create a more equitable society for people who are. I don't like these terms, but marginalized on the edges, you know, those, I don't think those terms are, I think they miss humanity, but I think there's a sense of what I mean, so I'll use it. But um, I think it's, it's, it's critical that there, there's change. And quite frankly, I think it's exciting for me at this time in my life to see there be so much um, 
political will and, and sorry, not political will, but so much action from uh, people to fight for change. And I think, and I've said this in a number of media reports, I think that the, the exciting thing is, is that, you know, COVID is, is raging through our communities quite literally, and people are, are still fighting because they recognize that it's time for there to be, you know, change. Thank you, Dustin. Um, there's like a, a lot to un unpack there. Um, yeah, Michelle, would you like to, um, to add something? Hold on, Michelle, I will uh, yes. unmute. Okay, great, you're unmuted. Yes, I think I'm on now. I truly, my gosh, Dustin, you have just created the, 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 the perfect, you know, segue for me. And it's, and it's a comment because we have at least a good uh, 30 years of collected data in the Office of Medicaid Services. And I know Jennifer knows about this, where we, it's in your face um, data that shows you know, the, the lack of quality, the lack of access to care. We have that information in reference to us black and brown folks because of the, the, the Medicaid formulary that we're on and what it has impacted um, our lives from coexisting, from um, coexisting diagnosis to also to new comorbidities that came into our lives because of the neglect. So for me, at this point in time, in 2020, it's not for me to learn or to hear about it anymore. It's action. What we can do in the present right now, and this is where, again, you know, it, it, it keeps me and it gives me the, the rejuvenation. You know, I, I have become rejuvenated in my advocacy now, you know, in reference to speaking about it's not about what we don't know. It's, what about, it's not what about we, what we need to know is what we need to act on. There is an act on right now that I am appealing and we have allies. You know, here's Jennifer, you know, we can speak of the different Lambda uh, staff, you know, who, who have, you know, who is aware of these things. But I truly believe there needs also to, to be that present and that involvement for many of us black and brown folks at these decision making tables. I demand, this is something that I demand right now, just yesterday. You know, I had to, you know, uh, pretty much address, you know, my doctor because there is some neglect that's coming into my care right now. Yes, I am 54, but because of what HIV has done to my body, uh, because it has not been, you know, it's been, yes, over a good 10 years that I have an undetectable viral load, but my diabetes and my mental health care is being jeopardized. And because of that, you know, it's impacting my viral load. So I am 100% adherent, yes, taking my medication, but because of the other specialty need and care that I am lacking, it is impacting my viral load. So my, my, my care is not just showing up at a doctor or getting a doctor to give me a prescription. My care today involves at least 80% of me being as, 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 um, as accurate as my information, what I collect every visit I have. I request a copy of my progress note because then it gives me really, I get a clear picture of my clinicians, their mindset and what it is that they're doing or not doing. And every bit of this, I'm teaching this. I am teaching this now as part of the work my job, I work as a full-time staff now at GMHC, and my title is the Healthy Aging Specialist. And I can tell you 90%, right, because the clients that I am working with is my aging over 50 LGBT individuals, you know, who's aging with AIDS and HIV. And I can tell you my work, as I screen them, I am screening these individuals for mental health issues, and also drug and alcohol substance use. And the richness that comes out of this uh, screening session, I am giving my clientele now of color, I'm giving them you know, pertinent information that we, they can then take to their doctor and say, listen, I have learned this and I've discovered this, and this is how you're gonna provide me my care now. 
you know so it's 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 the work can, it, it must continue but i have to say the more resources that i gather is what i am now putting it as part of my work deliverables in order to help the population my community that i'm working with because it's the first time I have to say, I, I, I believe it's Dustin that mentioned this, the mental health needs for my LGBT brothers and sisters in our community, it's at a critical point right now. And we need to be able, at least as you know, some of my aging colleagues would say, Michelle, at least we need to die with some form of dignity. Why not? You know, so. Can I say a quick comment, um, is that okay? Yeah, 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 please. Just, just to follow up on Michelle's point, um, that you know, and and, and, I, and, I, and, I, and I, given my perspective as a, as primarily an academic researcher, I I want to highlight that this may be a radical. I don't think it's radical. What I'm going to say, but it could be perceived as radical. Um, my job is to do research, to study populations, to do something that's meaningful and that's scientifically rigorous. But I think that there, it's it's very very clear, you know, based on the existing evidence. That there, are, uh, that there are huge disparities in a wide range of health conditions. And we are starting to know, and there's a, a, a accumulated literature and evidence to highlight why these disparities exist, including things like discrimination. And to highlight Michelle's point, I think I, I wanna say that, you know, I, I, as a researcher, I almost have to say there should be more research. And I, and I do believe that, but I think that action time is, now is the time for action. I don't think that we should wait for action at all. I think that it's, it's reassuring for me to hear Michelle and Jennifer and to hear Josh earlier, to hear what they're doing, because these are not spaces that I'm actively involved in. And my, my discussion with policymakers is somewhat limited and, and people who are advocates and, 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 and promoting public policy uh, changes. But I think time is now. Um, I just wanted to say that, sorry. Oh, no, no apologies necessary, and, and thank you. And I also just want to remind the audience to please submit questions that you have for our panelists um, to slido.com using the hashtag FTPrideWeek. Um, and Jennifer, um, I'll turn to you next. Uh, I know that you've, you've, we've heard a lot from Michelle and Dustin, so please, what, what, is, what, what, have, what are you thinking about um, with all this information? Yeah, thanks. Um, I've been thinking about it a lot as they've been speaking. And um, you had asked earlier, what are some similarities to the response to HIV and maybe now the response to COVID-19? I think about that a lot. I think there are um, lessons to be learned. I don't know if we'll learn them, but there are lessons to be learned. So one I wanted to highlight is we're we, we've we already covered how disparate the impact of COVID-19 is on people of color and um, populations that are not having as much access to healthcare. Um, there's evidence that shows that multi-generational family housing units can play a role, in, uh, which makes sense in risk because people are indoors together. And that's of course structured by your income and your um, employment circumstance and your housing uh, stock and all of these things. And I'm sure that's more like Dustin's area about neighborhoods, but all of these things play a role. And I'm thinking about how um, those factors make or what we see in the data when we see so many people of color in particular are disproportionately affected by COVID in terms of hospitalizations, in terms of deaths, et cetera. With HIV, if you look back at the earliest case reports from the CDC back in 1981, 1982, the first case reports, even then in the data, you could see that black Americans were disproportionately impacted by HIV. Nobody noticed. I mean, not nobody. I mean, some, some people noticed, but public health officials, public policymakers, nobody noticed. What that meant is a decade later, the impact was even greater. A decade later, even greater. And so one of the lessons there is there's, we know from all of these conditions that we were, we've heard about, there's always a disparate impact. Look for it initially, it's going to be there. If you don't, if you wait and look for it later, it's going to be much worse. So that's one lesson. Another is the very challenging relationship between politics and science and politics and public health. That's been part of the HIV um, uh, his story is when when politics kind of got in the way or took over from public health decisions that were made were not always based on science and the evidence we're seeing that with covid when where there's a real tension and struggle around um, science and and politics and what should be driving decisions about economies reopening about people um, getting the the public health information accurately that they need another so that's one another lesson another is data 
um, there's in HIV, we always had lots of challenging discussions around data. What do we know? What do we not know? Are the data accurate? Are the data, are, is getting more information going to be harmful to certain populations? All this is playing out now. Um, so, uh, and then the, the third, uh, the fourth, I would say is um, the importance of having clear public health messaging from leaders, um, what we need to know, what we don't know that had, has played out again and again in HIV. So um, there's a lot that we can learn from the response to HIV, but I'm not sure that we're learning it. Um, and then one other thing, just, it, um, you know, we have a real opportunity here with, between the Supreme Court decision and that coming on the heels of the HHS final rule, which would allow um, discrimination in healthcare based on sexual orientation and gender identity, whereas the Supreme Court said that is not allowable in the workplace. And so many people working in this field think that that Supreme Court decision um, maybe not directly negate the HHS rule, but really calls it into question. So there's a real opportunity now to see what happens and potentially have that, that rule not go forward. Thanks. Thank you. Um, and I think something that um, you all have iterated or talked about in the course of this this discussion is that we have the knowledge now and like we need to act on what we know now. We need to stop waiting for information and like make change. And so um, I'm, I'm hoping to turn to each of you and ask what you see as a next step um, in just addressing uh, the disparities that we see um, and making the future a bit more equitable. Um, Michelle, perhaps you could kick off uh, with your thoughts. Oh, you're um, you're un you're muted at the moment. So, okay, great. Yeah, okay, I'm gonna say it, and then I'm gonna sign off. But truly, as a communities of color, we must get out of our silos. We have the opportunity to work with our allies, and truly, I see it as a clear start. Very sorry for that interruption. My train just arrived. Oh, getting out of our silos and collaborating with our allies right now is going to be one of, I believe, one of the most effective level of us moving forward to end this level of discrimination, disparities, and the inequities that we are experiencing. Thank you. Thanks so much, Michelle, and safe travels. Um, we're so happy that you could join us. Uh, Dustin, um, perhaps you could take the question next. Um, what is it that we can be doing right now <laughs> um, to, to start, <coughs> kick off some change? <laughs> you certainly aren't asking easy questions, are you? Um, yeah, I was, I was being, I, I, I want to be thoughtful. Um, I guess I'll just delve into what Michelle said. You know, I think that we know that inequalities exist and I think that we know partly it's this othering of people and partly in including discrimination. Um, I don't know how to say this, so I'll, I'll say this uh, it, perhaps somewhat crassly and crudely, but I think it's critical that we recognize each other's humanity and that we and we as a society and really a global society, but including an American society, stop thinking that we're better than someone else. Um, I believe that in our society, we continually other people. You went to Ivy League school, you did not. You're black, you're white, you're gay, you're, you're straight, you're cis, you're trans. And, then, and, I, and I believe that we continually try to other ourselves and meaning the collective we, and we, uh, 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 oppress someone who uh, who's not in, in our group or, 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 or the dominant group. And I think that across society, that needs to not happen. One, because people are at so many intersections of these things, right? But also, I think that that leads to the inequalities that we see. Um, I don't know, and I, and I think your question's a partially, if I hear it correctly, it's partially a policy question, like pragmatically, what's the next step? I don't think I'm equipped, <laughs> maybe a good segue for Jennifer, to think through or, or to know or be knowledgeable about and say something effectively about, you know, the actual policies to enact or to reduce that otheringness. Um, but I think that needs to happen. And I, and I think that needs to happen really at the systemic level first for it to start trickling down for people to, to actually believe that, you know, there is no difference between any of us. 
Uh, thanks, Dustin. Um, and uh, Jen, I know that you gave a great uh, you gave a great list of you know different types of policy responses that we can start doing now from just thinking about data differently. Um, so uh, I, I don't know if you have anything else to add, or maybe to make the question that Dustin left um, left us with: uh, How do we go about making systems a bit more equitable? Yes, uh, not an easy question. Um, maybe I, I get to, as someone who works in policy and analysis, maybe it's easier um, to, to talk about those things. And um, we, as I mentioned earlier, even changing a policy or removing a legal barrier doesn't mean it, it's necessarily going to uh, be that way in everyone's lives. But um, I think there are, two, there are two things I would flag um, right now. Uh, these are general things that are really around um, uh, access for people of color to healthcare services, access to LGBT community to healthcare services in particular. Um, one would be, uh, as I mentioned, this this right now HHS has released a final rule that if it were to go forward would mean that um, individuals could be basically discriminated against in healthcare by a provider, by health insurer, just because of their sexual orientation or gender identity or their perceived sexual orientation or gender identity. Like that would be a legal thing. We're doing analysis of that where I work. And also one of the things we're looking at is, is that, you know, how does that match up with public opinion? We'll have a new poll coming out to look at that question because I would guess many Americans would not support uh, the idea of legally discriminating against people just because of their sexual orientation or gender identity or their race. So, um, so I, you know, one is to analyze these policies and, and really help people understand what the implications are for actual live, lived experience. Um, the second is, uh, I mentioned the ACA. Um, Right now, because of the ACA, uh, there is a, a Medicaid expansion component, which means states were able to dramatically expand Medicaid. Not all have done it, most have, but in those states that did, um, more people with HIV got access to coverage and more LGBTQ uh, individuals got access to coverage, more people of color got access to coverage, it expanded access, which is a key part of addressing some of the structural barriers we talked about. So, um, you know, those are just two concrete things um, they're, they're, you know, caught up in all kinds of partisan politics, but they're, they're really important out to understand and, and know about. Thanks. Thank you. Yeah. Um, I, I think we just, I think always have to continually ask ourselves, like, how does the system get created? And, you know, like you mentioned, it is, um, taking these ideas and biases and, you know, maybe inherent, maybe implicit, um, and making them into laws that have, um, effects that continue to perpetuate um, at different levels. Um, so I, I want to open it up to some of the questions that I hope everyone has been submitting to Slideo. Um, it may be a little bit of a technical, okay, great, we have a presentation. So um, <clears throat> I will uh, do my best to field different questions to um, our panelists. Um, so one of the questions that we have here, um, um, a lot of people might feel helpless and overwhelmed by these crises. Uh, what can we as individuals do to take action and affect change? Um, uh, D Dustin, do you have do you, do you have thoughts? <laughs> Sorry, I was unmuting myself. Uh, these are very difficult questions, um, but important. Um, and I, you know, when we t when we prepared this panel, I said a couple things about change, and everyone's protest is very different. Um, I think to broadly speaking, make your voice heard. Um, I, I think that means something that's different for different people. Um, uh, if that's for you, actually physically being protesting, then that's great. If that's giving to uh, a, 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 a a, a, a political uh, a campaign that you think will enact change, I think that's great. If that's writing an op-ed, I think that's great. Um, myself, I recently wrote an article in Medium, an essay really about being a black man in America and what that means for me and some of my experiences. Uh, some of my colleagues and friends said that, you know, it was a, a difficult read. Um, and I, it was fascinating to me is that, you know, those were light stories. I didn't say anything that was deep <laughs> in, in the sense of, I knew that it was a public essay and, you know, I, I specifically said it to, to colleagues broadly and, and friends and 
I have many, many, many stories I could say, but I just shared some some light ones. And, and hopefully, you know, the, the goal was to, one, for me to release some of the frustration that I was experiencing, but also to highlight things that, that, that I've experienced, which may help someone, including uh, my white friends and colleagues understand about um, my life and, uh, and, and, and other lives of black men, including black gay men. Um, but I would just say, make your voice heard. That, that's what I would say. Thank you. Yeah. Um, yeah, I guess our representatives and the people who make our laws do work for us. <laughs> um, so uh, that's always a good reminder to register to vote and do other things like that. Um, Jen, I was wondering if I could throw the next question to you. Um, the FT uh, is a global news organization and we have some uh, of our colleagues who don't live in the US. And so this question is quite pointed. Um, the US healthcare system has always baffled me. Are there any redeeming qualities of the system that we currently deal with? Well, that's a good question. It would require hours and hours of discussion, but, and, it, and it's true, it's a baffling system. It's very different than most. And actually, if you compare the US to other, so like pure countries and um, say in the North and in Europe and Canada, Australia, we spend more per person on healthcare and we, our outcomes are not as good. So something, there's a mismatch there. However, you know, I think, you know, we, we as a country overall um, do, perf you know, do have quality care measures that are better than other countries because of our GDP, because of access to um, providers. So, I mean, it's not an all, it's not all bad. Um, and we've had incredible successes. I mean, actually, we talked about some of the challenges with HIV, but there's been incredible successes with HIV. And much of the um, uh, and pioneering research and interventions have been from the U.S. experience. So, um, you know, there's, it's, it's not all bad. I mean, one of the features, though, of the U.S. that makes it challenging is that we, it's not just one system. It's the, nat the federal government and then 50 states and D.C. and the territories. And every, there's different... Um, that plays out quite differently. Um, there's disparities in funding, disparities in access that vary across the country. So I don't have an easy answer for that question, but it's, it's all relative. Um, uh, you know, there, there are some of the highest quality um, uh, providers are in the world are in the United States. Um, and that's a good part of the story. Thank you. Um, and uh, this third question, um, it may be a little bit too early to tell, but I do feel like, you know, the moment that we're living in on top of living in the pandemic, we're living in a really amazing moment where people like we're seeing people take to the streets in this like new civil rights movement in a way. Um, and so um, we have a question about if we, if we will start to see traction from movements like Black like Black Lives Matter work their way into policy decisions. Um, is there any way that we can tell if healthcare is being impacted um, because of the events over the past couple of weeks? Um, Dustin, do you have any initial thoughts, um, whether it be about policy specifically or more so just about our ability to have more types of, more of these conversations um, in more types of places? Sorry, yeah, I, I, I was reading that, uh, that question um, as Jennifer was talking, and it reminded me of a colleague of mine from Columbia who's going to Harvard, I think, in a week, uh, Mark Hudson-Buehler. He did a study where he looked at the effects of same-sex marriage laws um, and healthcare use and expenditures among sexual minority men. I literally just pulled it up, and he found that, um, that sexual minority men who lived in places with uh, legalization of same-sex marriage had significantly decreases in, uh, in medical care visits, um, uh, uh, mental health visits and mental health uh, uh, costs. Essentially, we see like improved health outcomes. So I, I would imagine that policy changes eventually will trickle down into you know, impacts on individual health. Um, I think it's like us, up to us as researchers um, and, and, and people who are policy researchers, especially to study that specifically with, you know, rigorous designs that would convince policymakers that, you know, this is a, 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 an important study. But I imagine that my hypothesis is that over the next year, we're going to see a, a ton of studies we're getting to policy uh, 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 in, in a myriad of ways, because there's a lot, my, as a non-policy person, um, my sense is there's a lot of policy changes and action that's happening and, and that will happen from this, um, even at the micro level. So um, I would say existing research shows that, that that's, that's 
uh, uh, likely and stay tuned for, you know, from researchers to see what's, what's what. Uh, thank you. Yeah, that's, that's really great to hear um, and that people are already at work, uh, I guess, using the momentum that we have. Um, Jen, would you like to add anything? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I think if a, a lot of the discussion around Black Lives Matter right now, the sort of what, what is happening with it, given um, the protests and, on the street and the issues around health are really, they've completely intersected um, because there's been so many discussions around what, how COVID is affecting the same, the very same communities also around, you know, will protests um, lead to any spikes in, in transmission? So far, the data seems to say no, or, um, but there's been this sort of intersection of the two. I don't think uh, we can, they can be, I don't think they can be taken apart, but I think that's really been much more front and center in the discussion than, than has ever been because it's happened, this sort of um, new uh, energy, or not new energy, or national energy around Black Lives Matter and, and sort of pro protesting against racial and ra racial discrimination and promoting um, racial justice is taking place in the middle of a, a pandemic. So it's you know it, every we're, it's all about both things. Yeah, thank you, and that's I think just a great thought to end on is that um, I think. Uh, to the great insights that Michelle shared about people operating in silos and how that, you know, kind of perpetuates inequality to both the insight that Dustin and, and Jen that you have with your fields and policy and academia, we we definitely have to think about this, of this question um, holistically, if I may use that word, um, because it's a system-wide problem and uh, but but we so we have to like it just engage at every single level with like all people with people who are getting care and people who are providing care with the policymakers with the academics and hopefully come together to just share our knowledge and build new kinds of communities and connection to like solve these problems now. So um, I really do want to thank you, um, Michelle, Dustin, and Jen for joining us and taking some time out of your schedule during the middle of the pandemic to share your insights and perspective. I have learned a lot and um, will be forever grateful for the opportunity to talk to you um, and, and hear your stories. Um, and I think I'll just pass it over to um, Andre of FT Proud uh, for some closing thoughts. Hi, uh, yeah. So thanks so much. Um, honestly, that was an incredible panel. Um, Thank you just personally to each and every one of you for, you know, um, volunteering, um, you know, taking our, you know, intention to really educate um, ourselves, our staff, um, and to just really remind everyone that, yes, there is a lot of hardship. There's a lot of inequality, um, not just in healthcare. We've seen it. It's pervasive throughout all, all parts of society. Um, and I think these protests have really highlighted that this coronavirus pandemic has really highlighted that. But above all else, I do think we can kind of walk away with the sense that, you know, there are people who care about these things. Um, and the most important kind of message, I guess, if I, I would say I took from, from this and just in generally from the past few months, the past few weeks, is we really do all, it starts with us individually. Um, you know, step one, things like this panel, they help to educate us and really bring light to perspectives that we may not have otherwise, you know, gotten. Um, and, you know, the next steps are, yeah, get involved, take action, whether that looks like a protest, whether that looks like just making your voice heard to your policymakers. Um, for everyone in the U.S., like vote, we have a lot of, we have primaries, we have the big election in November. Um, but in general, just again, thank you guys so much for joining. Um, wish you guys the best this afternoon and everyone who, who's been watching thank you again for joining us and please be sure to tune in for the rest of this week's events and we have another fantastic panel planned on thursday as well um but yeah so thank you everyone so much and have a fantastic afternoon